on the phone to uh, catch me up from the uh, the past week's uh, festivities. I just spent the weekend in uh, Disney World, and so I have, um, well, all sorts of uh, merchandise just rolling through my head right now. Uh, from the great blog, Hullabaloo Digby. Welcome to the program, Digby. Thanks for having me, Sam. Uh, now, you're going to have to uh, bear with me. Um, I have the uh, sounds of uh, It's a Small World playing through my head. <laughs> and uh, the Lion King and uh, the Little Mermaid and, oh, God. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I'm about to pass out just thinking about it. Still recovering from Space Mountain. Uh, but, uh, so, uh, this was quite a week, uh, Digby. I really took a good week to take a vacation, huh? You sure did. I mean, not that you missed anything, um, you know, world shattering. There were, you know, the North Koreans did try to launch a satellite and it kind of, uh, fizzled out. Um, other than that, um, basically what we've been talking about pretty much nonstop is the fact that uh, Hillary Rosen, a Democratic strategist... Yeah, wait a second, let me stop uh, you right here. Who is... I mean, I I was... You know, like, I dipped in and out of AM talk radio over the course of the week, and then all of a sudden, just sort of out of the blue, everything was just Hillary Rosen, and I just... I was (laughs) racking my brain, like, wait a second. I vaguely know who that is, I think. She's, like, a, a talk... What did she? What did she do? Did she try and like, like, like strap bombs to herself or something? What, 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 <laughs> yes, she 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 announced that she was now a terrorist. No, <laughs> she said something very very innocuous, um, and unfortunately, she put it in a way that gave the uh, social conservatives and the Republican Party something to grasp onto to stage a counterattack in the this uh, quote war on women. What she said was that. Um, you know, Mitt Romney, first let me just sort of give some context. Mitt Romney has been saying, you know, I send out my wife out on the campaign trail, and she comes back and she tells me what average women are going through and experiencing. Well, then, now that's understandable because, you know, um, if you, uh, you, you want someone who speaks the language of this small subset of Americans, right. Uh, right. knows the cultural to... mores, uh, so they <laughs> right. can, you know, this is a, right. the, women are very, um, they're very sort of, uh, they, they keep to themselves. And, um, <laughs> they do, and, you, and he's not likely to run into any of them on the campaign trail himself. Right. He needs to send out someone to find them so he can understand what they're, what they're thinking. Thinking, you know what these what this strange tribe uh, is thinking. Um, so uh, you know clearly Mitt Romney, you know he's out there every day um, and he has no clue about what half of the voters are thinking. So he sends out his wife, mm. and she comes back and she reports to him. Here's what they're thinking. So Hillary Rosen. <laughs> Is who you know? She's a lobbyist. She's a you know. She's on the. She was like. Well, she was she like head of the T-shirt. Recording uh, industry yeah. association, right? I mean, she was right. She, she was attacking Napster. A- exactly, and you know this. <laughs> so, you know, she's 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 been around. She's one of those people who's on TV. You know, they call her up, and she's on the Rolodex, and you know, she's a DC insider, and she's. You know, she is portrayed as a Democratic strategist, and I think in this case they erroneously said she was an Obama advisor, which she is not, at least not in any official capacity. So she makes a comment in which she says, foolishly, uh, Ann Romney's never, you know, Mitt Romney sends his wife out to tell him what women are thinking, and Ann Romney's never worked a day in her life. And, oh, my God, the shot heard round the world. The entire world exploded because in that comment, Hillary Rosen was said to have insulted all women who stay at home to take care of their children. Mm. Now, if you see her full, co- the, you know, her full comment, you can see that she's talking about the fact that Ann Romney is a vastly wealthy woman who does not understand the... Um, you know, the, the, the concerns of an average working American woman, which, of course, is true. Uh, Ann Romney has never held a, a job for wages in her life. Now, you know, when I heard it, I kind of went, oh, geez, here we go, because we've been through this before. And 
they are always going to, they were waiting for a chance to pit the good girls against the bad girls, uh, as uh, Amanda Marcotte put it, which is, you know, we have the sluts on the one hand who want everybody to pay for their birth control so they can be promiscuous. That's us. Right. And then you have the good girls like Ann Romney who stay home and take care of their children or, or wish they could, I guess. So that, you know, that's the way they wanted to frame it, and they got a chance to do it, and everybody went nuts. And Wolf Blitzer had Hillary Rosen on. This happened on Wolf Blitzer's show. He had her on the next night and basically spoke to her like a five-year-old child, saying, all right, Hillary, I want you to face the camera and apologize. <laughs> and she, it was kind of like a hostage video. It was, okay, I'm very sorry for anything I said. I deeply apologize. I will never say it again. It was horrible. And I thought, wow. And, of course, the Democratic Party just completely threw her under the bus. I mean, it was com- there was no holds barred. Everybody came out from the First Lady to everybody else. I don't think Obama said anything, but maybe he did. Um, but it was inappropriate and, you know, all the usual nonsense. So the, uh, the war on women, basically the, you know, the, the Republicans had a good day, a good few days in which they, you know, fought back and said that, um, you know, were able to at least persuade their own people that they had won and that they can put this one behind us, behind them. I, you know, I don't think that's actually true. I think the whole, um, you know, the discussion about women's rights and the war on women is going to go with us through the entire campaign. And mainly because you keep hearing stuff, you know, they keep doing things like here was another good one. In Arizona, they just passed the law that said that, um, you know, life begins before conception now. Right. That's, so, uh, you, you, know. you need, basically that you, 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 you count um, a, a woman's pregnancy from the time of her last period. Is that basically what the it beginning is? Beginning of her last period. <laughs> so you know, I don't know. I mean, I guess some of these these pregnancies are immaculate, um, <laughs> or something weird's going on there because that makes no no sense. <laughs> now, I did see some doctors talking about this and saying, you know, hey, look, anybody who's trying to, you know, ex- accurately uh, date. Pregnancy, you know, that's a fool's errand. Nobody can do that. That's just, you can't do it, you know, and it's just, nobody knows exactly when it happens. So the idea that they, what, what, what was significant about this was, is that they went 18, that means it's 18 weeks, which actually goes against uh, the Supreme Court rulings about late term pregnancies. And so there'll be a constitutional um, question about this on whether or not they can do it. It's amazing that they were that they decided to do it though. There was a ton of controversy. People all knew about it and they did it anyway. Jan Brewer signed it along with the law that said that if a doctor fails to, you know, doesn't tell you that about potential birth defects that you can't sue them. So <clears throat> which isn't uh, such a terrible thing in and of itself. It's a protection for doctors and malpractice and what have you. Uh, lots of states have it, but within the context of all these other laws that they're passing in Arizona, that one seemed a little bit, you know, not only <laughs> you know, do they, do, does life begin before conception, uh, if your doctor is some kind of a wingnut who decides that they're not going to tell you that right. your right. You know, fetus is, is, has a problem, uh, you can't sue them for that either. I mean, it all seemed to sort of work within that. So it was an exciting week, and I think that this, uh, you know, the... The war on women will continue whether the right wing wants it to or not. Meanwhile, Mitt Romney last night or a couple nights ago apparently had a fundraiser that a reporter overheard. The press was not invited, was standing out in the sidewalk outside listening. And Romney said basically, you know, don't worry about anything I say. I don't mean anything. I don't mean it. I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but basically that's what he said. And then Romney said, instead of saying, you know, I can't tell you all how hurt I was by Hillary Rosen's comment and how angry and insulted I felt for women all over the country who stay home and take care of their kids and that realize what a hard job that is. She didn't say that, but she said it was like an early birthday present. <laughs> it's just, it just, you know, maybe it's just taking a week off and just sort of like, you know, only hearing this on the fringe, almost I think like probably normal people do. 
You know, uh, we, we live in this sort of bubble where we actually follow this stuff on a day-to-day basis. <laughs> right. And it just sounded all just so bizarre. I mean, this is coming in the wake of a, uh, uh, a uh, an attempted firebombing of a Planned Parenthood yep. uh, that, that didn't provide any abortion services, that just provide uh, health services for women. Uh, this is coming, you know, with this sort of uh, notion that uh, wasn't there some comment about the Masters as well? Uh, this mm-hmm. golf tournament uh, where they, the club doesn't allow women, and the right wing got all up in arms about the idea that somebody would would comment on this. Like we can't. It's what, what is this country coming to that we can't have all men golf clubs or? Uh, yeah. what, what, I, well, I mean, it was it was twofold. I mean, first of all, the New there was a New York Times reporter who is the golf reporter, who who made a public comment about how offended she was by all that. Apparently, she went to the press conference down there in Augusta, and you know they wouldn't call on her. Yeah, you know, she's just really petty nonsense. And then, well, don't they she, need to have a woman call on her to understand what she's asking? I mean, isn't this the <laughs> they problem? Have said, yeah, exactly. And they don't have any women, so you know she was just out of luck. Right. They, um, you have to get a <laughs> Google Translate or something to understand what this. Something. Yeah, there must be some way to do this. There must be some technology available to make it possible to understand what a woman, what a question a woman is asking. Um, well, she complained about it, and her, and it was reported that her editor. Uh, reprimanded her, and the way he reprimanded her said she's been spoken to. She was wrong, and she's been spoken to. Well, you know, we're going, really? I mean, she's been spoken to? Did you give her spanking, too, and send her to bed without her dinner? I mean, it was just ridiculous. Eric Erickson of Red State and CNN contributor. Um, this guy is famous for saying, calling uh, the Supreme Court Justice Souter a, um, a goat effer. Is that right? That's right. And child molester. Yeah. Oh. He was a go to for child molester. I know. I put um, that on my resume when I tried to get a contributor job at CNN. It didn't, it didn't, didn't work. work. They said, you. we got one of these huh. already. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, you know, they can only, they, you only need one right. to really, you know, carry that message through. Uh, anyway, he was, he was offended. He has a radio show now, too, and he says that he, uh, he was very, you know, he doesn't understand why anybody would want to, you know, says that the that the Masters should be, or that the Augusta Golf Club um, should be, uh, well, desegregated, essentially. Um, why can't men just be in places where there are only men? You know, this is ridiculous, you know. So, yeah, we had that. Um, you know, it, it's just, you know, it, it's carrying on, and, and I feel... You know, so much of this is being, this conversation is being held in, in the, this sort of, you know, kind of embarrassing way where you know, we're talking about, you know, I mean, Hillary Rosen says something wrong on a TV show, so we have a huge firestorm about it. We get, you know, we get in this. But the truth is, is that this is really a, you know, this is a serious issue. There have been nearly a thousand. Uh, different bills proposed in states throughout the country since 2010 to restrict women's rights. And in fact, you know, Scott Walker up in Wisconsin, he just repealed the, the, their, you know, their state Lilly Ledbetter Act. So it's not just about reproductive rights. They're going after women's, you know, workplace rights as well. I mean, I, um, I'm fairly convinced that reproductive rights is, is really, is in many respects, um, is founded at least on some level, uh, on an economic level. I mean, that, 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 that once you emancipate women uh, and give them rights and sovereignty over their own body, uh, they become uh, e- economic players and, um, you know, full-fledged economic players. And this, in some way, doubles back to the sort of notion about women encroaching upon uh, man's space in some fashion. And, you know, I guess it, it, it's sort of like those lines are blurry between the imp- economic implications and the sort of the social implications. Uh, but it seems to me all part of a whole. And I, I, I'm just, you know, it, it's, it, and apparently, uh, I guess Chris Hayes had a big um, find over the weekend where uh, Mitt Romney uh, came out and said that, you know, when he uh, was governor of Massachusetts, and he said this all the way back in January <laughs> of 2012, <laughs> apparently none of the hundreds of people who are paid to cover Mitt Romney uh, <clears throat> remembered that he said this. But mm-hmm. he said that, um, uh, that he wanted uh, women who were on welfare, uh, he would provide them daycare just so they can get back and work after two years so they can have the dignity of having uh, a work. job. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, it's just, it, it is, it's stunning to me. And, you know, when we're talking about um, uh, Ann Romney, you know, I, I hope that we're going to get full disclosure and find out, did she, maybe she was also a manager. How many nannies did she have for those seven kids? I, I would imagine at least maybe one. Um, uh, it, would be, it would be interesting to see. Where's the five kids? Once you right, get past yeah, three, had, apparently it's all the same. That's what well, I've been she told. had six, according to her, because Mitt, according to the ad that they put out, was kind of like her sixth son, mm. um, because he's such a crazy cut-up and uh, evidently very immature and puerile. Yeah, um, you got to keep him from putting the dog on the roof of the car. <laughs> right. I mean, that's the kind of thing he does if you just let him go. So, you know, and then she says that, you know, you know <laughs> well, I won't even go there, but, you know, she made the comment that, you know, people say that we've got to, you know, unzip Mitt and... <laughs> Find out if he's really got something going on. I mean, I can't say yeah, yeah, like, but it was like, Unzip whoa, him okay. to find out that to prove that he's not stiff or something. <laughs> right, exactly. He's not really a stiff. And I thought, wow, you know, TMI, and Don't need to know that. You uh, know, <laughs> the, 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 the Romney, uh, the, the, the story about Romney and his uh, funders uh, reminded me of a story that uh, I can't remember who first reported. I think I saw L- uh, Lee Fong, though. Uh, that uh, Jim Messina had basically been telling in February, I guess this came out, had basically met with bankers and said, don't worry, um, uh, Obama's not going to be a populist here. Yeah. And it, it just seems that, I mean, we go through this, you know, this is almost stating the obvious, but there are real issues in terms of what's going on with women's rights in this campaign. Uh, there are real issues of what's going on in terms of economics. And we get sort of like the sanitized shadow version of this, mm-hmm. where it just gets played out in terms of these silly sort of um, shadows of what the real policies and the real implications are. Absolutely. And in fact, I mean, anybody who's on the emailing list, <clears throat> you can kind of see the way that that works. I've been inundated, inundated with, I don't know, 30 emails a day from the Democratic, some Democratic Party group, whether it's the DCCC, the Congressional Campaign Committee, or the DNC or somebody, on the war on women. Send us money. We have to, you know, we've got to fight this war on women. We're on your side. Help us out here. Now's the time. So they're fundraising big time off of it. Meanwhile, they're out there supporting anti-choice candidates. Right. Um, you know, I don't know what to say about that. That's like, to, to me, it's, it would be like saying, you know, we really care, you know, the, this whole issue around Trayvon Martin, we really want to, uh, you know, we care, we've got to, we've got to do something about this. So, you know, systemic racism in America still exists. Please send us money so we can fight it. And then they give money to the NRA. It would be the same thing, and it's, you know, or maybe even worse than the NRA. I mean, you know, I don't know. Um, it, it, well, it, you know, we're going to support uh, guys who sort of feel like, you know, uh, you know, we should be doing racial profiling. Yeah, uh, exactly, or, or, you know, whatever. I mean, you know, the, the Council of Conservative Citizens or something. I mean, I, I think that it's the same thing, honestly. I'm appalled by it. I mean, they're out there recruiting people who are, pr- who are anti-choice. In this environment, meanwhile, they're on TV every day, you know, railing, oh, the war on women and doing that. And, you know, this is, this is how it works. I mean, there's a real, you know, there's, there's real politics that are happening on one level, and that's Jim Messina, you know, going to the banks and saying, hey, don't worry, you know, we're with you. We've got Mitt Romney telling his wealthy donors, hey, you know, don't worry, we're going to get rid of the Department of Education. Let's just, you know, but I can't say that. And we're going to put up some phony Republican Dream Act so we can lure a bunch of, you know, Hispanic rubes before they know what we're really doing. I mean, he's saying that stuff. Uh, you know, obviously, I'm paraphrasing. Nobody, you know, quote me on that. But he's, you know, that's essentially what they're doing. And then you've got the, you know, the, the Democratic Party raising money on the war on women while they're out there recruiting anti-choice candidates, people who, they're up there in, in Pennsylvania supporting this guy, Tim Holden, who is an incumbent, and, you know, they're not overtly supporting him. I mean, they're not out there, you know, <laughs> raising money for him, but Steny Hoyer was up there campaigning with him, sure. and, you know, he's getting plenty of money from institutional sources, let's just put it that way, and, I, that, you know, there, there are plenty of people making phone calls behind the scenes to Democratic donors saying don't donate to his opponent. 
And he's a hardcore anti-choice. He voted against Planned Parenthood. He voted against Nancy Pelosi for, you know, for speaker. I mean, and they're supporting that. Meanwhile, they're collecting your money and my money on this war on women, saying, you know, we're the, you know, we're all that stands between you and a Handmaid's Tale, you know. And it's like, and what's yeah, also this is what's also stunning to me is that you know there was a there was a piece out yesterday in the New York Times <clears throat> that. Um, uh, that, that basically outlined a line that the, the, the majority of women who stay at home um, do so because they, they almost they can't even afford to go out and work because they can't provide child care for their children. And so, you know, there, there is actually affirmative steps that, the, that uh, can be taken to, uh, to help women in this situation. You know, some type of uh, funded child care for people. Uh, you know, some type of um, assistance for, uh, for poor children. Uh, some type of assistance in terms of, uh, of, of universal health care. There, there are actually, like, you know, sort of uh, steps that can be taken that can help people. And there doesn't seem to be any party that is even attempting to fundraise on the notion of that. That's how far afield we are from the actual issues. Oh, absolutely. I mean, this is, I mean, certainly the Republicans are never going to do that. I mean, they, are, they're disma- they want to dismantle the federal government, you know, one department at a time. Uh, certainly anything like, you know, support for, you know, work- working women, they want to get rid of, the, you know, things like the earned income tax credit because th- that means that people aren't, you know, the poor people aren't paying their fair share of taxes. You know, you remember Michelle Bachman saying right. everybody's got to pay something, you know. So that's what, you know, that those are the women that you're talking about. The earned income tax credit is for people with kids that don't make very much money. And so they get to put some more money in their pocket. And it's actually helped them a lot in alleviating poverty among a vast swath of, of people. No, they want to get rid of that. Now, the Democrats, on the other hand, are basically, you know, look, they're going to, they're going to, Fix the deficit. That seems to be their big, um, you know, their big uh, selling point at this point. You know, and maybe if we're lucky, they'll build a couple of roads. But right. and there's <clears> nothing, other than that, you know, there's nothing that is uh, that is weighing on a um, a, a woman or a mother's uh, mind uh, when they're trying to figure out how they're going to feed their kids this week, uh, or uh, frankly, uh, a father's mind. Uh, if they're trying to figure out the same thing, then what are we going to do about this deficit? How can how can we <laughs> how can we manage the cost of Social Security uh, and cut Social Security so that we can we can pay for these uh, tax cuts? And you know, this is a good time to actually just mention that there's a um, United for Women UniteWomen.org is uh, uh, organizing marches on April 28th. So people can go to uh, UniteWomen.org to check that out. But uh, as we talk about the Democrats, there are some Democrats who are attempting to sort of uh, uh, fashion a rational budget. I've talked about it uh, briefly in the past. I mean, I, I don't even talking about budget stuff that much because I don't think any, any of it's really going to pass. But um, uh, Alan West basically said that the, uh, the members of the Progressive Caucus um, who have come out with what is an incredibly rational budget, I think, if you were to present it, and it doesn't get presented to Americans, uh, uh, presenting a very rational, he's calling them all communists. Well, yeah, and it was one of those things. I mean, it sounded exactly like, uh, you know, like, like McCarthy. I mean, he, they said, you know, do you think they're, call-, you know, he was at a town hall meeting, and, and one of the people, you know, his followers there said, do you think there are communists in the U.S. Congress? He goes, oh, yeah, you know. I think there are 80 of them, or something like 81 at least. <laughs> he had some specific number, like McCarthy had about, you know, remember in the Army, he, he accused the Army of harboring, and the State Department of harboring communists. And they went back after, and asked him later, the, the press did, you know, well, who were you talking about? And he named the Progressive Caucus. They're all communists. You know, that's what he said. No, it's the Progressive Caucus. These are the, these are the communists. What's interesting is that if you go and look at the budget that you're talking about, the people's budget, they call it, um, cuts the deficit more than Paul Ryan's budget does and more than President Obama's budget does. Um, And it does it while expanding 
uh, Social Security, actually making it a little bit, I mean, it's not like people can really live comfortably on Social Security by any means. I mean, it's a bare subsistence living if you don't have anything, you know, any savings. Um, and they do it by, you know, raising taxes on the wealthy and ending the wars. Now, sounds like common sense to me. And, you know, yet that budget is not even, I mean, nobody covers it. Nobody wants to talk about it. It's as if it's the craziest thing in the world. They've basically said something totally loony, like, uh, oh, we're going to, you know, destroy Medicare, <laughs> which is what Paul Ryan actually did. Um, it's an it's an absolutely you know stunning sort of illustration of how completely unbalanced our discussion about budgets are. There's no reason that that budget should not be in the mix, at least discussed with the same amount of seriousness as the Ryan budget. But because it um, does things like you know it cuts the Defense Department and it cuts. Uh, and it, you know, it, it raises taxes on the wealthy. I think it lets all the Bush tax cuts um, expire, yep. um, which is, you know, the law. Um, and, you know, it's like they, they might as well be speaking in Swahili. And we're talking yeah. about uh, nearly nearly 50 percent, uh, maybe a little bit less, I mean, but 40 um, percent of the Democrats. Yeah. When you're talking I mean, about 80 expansion. out of 190 uh, or so. Uh, I mean, <laughs> and by the way, wait, nobody came up and said anything about that. Alan West makes this statement, which I think is, you know, that's, I don't think I've heard that in a long time. Where Michelle Bachman, that, I think, on, uh, on Tweety's show a couple of years ago uh, said right. something to that effect, right? I mean, that there's, uh, or maybe that there are Congress people who are working against America, whatever it is. We needed, she said they needed an investigation into who was working, you know, who was, I don't know, treasonous or unpatriotic or something, un-American. Um, and, and Alan West comes right out and says that, that the Progressive Caucus, which is a huge faction in the Democratic Party, they're all a bunch of communists. And meanwhile, you know, nobody says anything. I don't, re- you know, did, was he rebuked by any public officials? Did anybody say anything? I mean, Hillary Rosen was just basically, tra- <laughs> you know, uh, you know, she was tarred and feathered metaphorically uh, for her passing comment. And Alan West calls all the Democrats in the House, you know, the progressive Democrats in the House, a bunch of commies and uh, nothing. So. You know, I, I guess we just the uh, the, the Democrats don't mind that. Yes, um, that's that's perfectly fine. I mean, uh, it, yeah. it, uh, it's stunning. I mean, he's a lunatic, Alan West, but yeah. he, he should be treated like a lunatic. Is the point? Uh, well, I mean, come on. I mean, the guys out there. He's he's one of their you know one of their flagship Tea Party guys. They you know he is not he's a lunatic and he is at the fringe for sure. But you know so. So it's a good part of the Republican caucus. So, right. All right. Well, speaking of another lunatic who is sort of, le- I guess he's just, he's just, I feel like he's left me in a lurch. Uh, you know, I never had a chance to say goodbye, but Rick Santorum, uh, he's, 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 he's gone. He's, he won't be forgotten uh, because he pulled Romney so far to the right that he actually opened up space for Obama uh, not to attack Romney on being a Wall Street uh, yep. uh, raider, frankly. Uh, but um, uh, the, he's gone now, right? I mean, uh, he's just waiting, I guess, until 2016 where he runs another crazy race. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I, I have to assume that they were looking at poll numbers that showed that he was going to lose Pennsylvania hugely, as he did the last time he ran in Pennsylvania, his home state. So uh, perhaps they figured it was the better part of valor to check out. But he did leave a mark on the race. I mean, he's the one who brought contraception into the conversation. Um, you know, he made those remarks in Iowa in which he said not just that he didn't believe that uh, the government should pay for contraception, but that no one should use contraception because it was... I don't know. It cheapened, it cheapened the sexual act, or you know. Well, it makes women have <laughs> sex for the wrong reasons. Right. They don't. They. They. You know. They don't understand what they're for when they have sex for play. And yeah, that's what he said. That it was, you know, it, that sex should not be about pleasure. All right. Yeah, it's going to come as a hell of a surprise to the human race. But you know, thanks very much for that, Rick. Um, meanwhile, you know, he left. That ended up 
becoming a major theme of the primaries. It pushed Romney way over to the right of where he wanted to be on these social issues. Um, And I think that he did open up this conversation about contraception, which has been bubbling in the background for years. I mean, it's not, you know, obviously the Catholic bishops have been on this for some time, but, you know, it hadn't really burst into the mainstream. And, of course, you know, I think that it hasn't worked for them in this cycle and probably won't. I mean, I don't think people are ready to, you know, concede the contraception issue. (laughs) So I think that that's probably a loser for them, but they don't care. They're playing a long game. They just wanted to get it into the debate. And if we know the Democrats, if they behave the way that they usually do, they'll be saying, well, we're going to fight to the end on contraception, but, you know, we may have to find some common ground on abortion rights. So, you know, that's just the way it is. Well, it's interesting what it's done to the race, because on one hand, it has raised this issue, and it is, in many respects, you know, this and the Komen Foundation uh, and other issues have sort of uh, ignited and maybe and hopefully uh, engaged um, more people into uh, sort of the political sphere to understand what's been going on, uh, but it does it do, did have that effect of basically putting Romney into this category of you know sort of crazy social conservative Republicans, which makes it easier for Obama to run against uh, Romney on that accord, as opposed to uh, you know. It looked like uh, maybe three months ago or two and a half months ago that uh, there was a huge opening for Obama, if he would take it, which he, you know, I think it's pretty clear he won't, to attack this guy as a um, a financial vulture. And right. it, it, and I don't think we're going to see that from uh, Obama now, uh, I, at I, least I, unless he uh, if, unless the polls are really bad for him come September or October. Yeah, I think it depends on on that and the economy. You know, the economy is still sputtery, and we don't really know what's happening. I mean, I guess, you know, the polling that I've seen shows that people aren't feeling it yet. If it is improving, and, you know, Obama needs them to start feeling it, like, soon, (laughs) in order for that to accrue to his benefit. Otherwise, it's just a dogfight over, you know, proxy issues, probably. Right. Um, But... Yeah, I mean, and, you know, we did have, they're probably relieved about that, because Jim Messina, as you pointed out, told them, you know, don't worry, we're your friends. So they'd prefer not to have to make that argument, I think, if they can, that Romney's a vulture capitalist and that he represents everything that's wrong with the American system. I think they'd prefer to have the fight, uh, you know, on this other terrain. Now, for me, as as a woman, I don't mind having that fight on the terrain, that particular terrain. I, I don't consider it to be a lesser issue or something that's not important. Um, I think it is important, and I think as long as we continue to discuss how this affects everyone economically, I think that um, you know plenty of men will be receptive to that issue as well. I mean, this really is, they're telling everybody, men, you need to work two jobs, and women, you need to stop working. I mean, if, you know, you want to get down to it, that's what they're saying. You need to go have a bunch of kids. You know, guys, you need to start working at two low-paying jobs exactly. in order to support them. That's our vision for America. That's what we want you all to do. And the rest of us will be sitting, you know, we'll be on our yacht plotting our, you know, our next, uh, you know, our next catastrophe. It's uniquely American, I think, as George Bush would say. Yeah, uh, exactly. All right, so catch me up on this now. Uh, apparently, um, Zimmerman, uh, the guy who shot Trayvon Martin, um, has been, uh, charged with second degree, uh, murder. Uh, I, you know, once the guy gets put into the system, my interest in sort of the, the aspects of his crime, uh, become less relevant to me, uh, and the issue of just profiling and, uh, the issue of the the fact that, you know, if you're a, a black teenager or a young black man, uh, whether it's you got to worry about the cops in New York City with stop and frisk or some nut job who feels he has a license uh, to go after you uh, because of these stand your ground, uh, uh, you know, uh, laws uh, becomes more of an issue. But uh, you also, it also seemed to have smoked out, like, tell me about John Derbyshire. I'm not terribly familiar with him. 
Well, you know, he's been a writer for National Review and, you know, right-wing publications for years. He's He's always been way out there, and the fact that he finally said something that was so appalling that they actually had to fire him says something, because he's been saying appalling things for years. But he wrote a column in which he he was responding to a bunch of of uh, you know columns and various things that had been written by by um, African American parents who were talking about how they have to teach their sons, in particular, the rules. Which was just heartbreaking to me. I mean, uh, you know, obviously I'm, I'm, I don't live that, that, that reality the way they do, and I was really unaware of how frightening it is for so many. You know, I mean, we're talking about all African-American parents. It doesn't matter what their socioeconomic um, level is. They are all frightened when their teenage boys are out on the street because they know that something like this could happen. So they teach them all these rules about how to behave in public so that they don't draw that kind of attention. And it's just, I'm thinking, wow, you know, what must that be like? I mean, it's not quite as bad as Jim Crow, but, hey, you know, not that far either. And Derbyshire responded to that by writing a rules for, you know, what he tells his children, which, are, which was basically stay away from black people, they're all violent and they'll try to kill you. And it was a horrifying racist screed that the likes of which you don't normally see anywhere other than some website like Stormfront. Um, and it caused a lot of, of problems for Rich Lowry, who had been running a little crusade on National Review Online about um, how we should, you know, why aren't we talking about black-on-black black crime, you know, like you know, like you care, Rich, but whatever. Um, so suddenly he was kind of put in a bad position. And, and by the way, Derbyshire didn't write this in National Review. He wrote it on, what's it called, Talkies. You know, that guy, that right-winger, Taki, he has a website anyway. He wrote it on that. Um, but he's, Derbyshire was associated and, and very, you know, uh, he was associated with National Review in a way that that's where sort of people thought was his home. Rit Lowry ended up firing him, which is kind of a surprise because, you know, I, I, usually they double down on this. But, it, but what Derbyshire said was just bad enough that I think even they couldn't tolerate it. Well, I think, you know, it's going to be much, it would be much harder uh, for the National Review to uh, sort of have their subtle racism if, they, um, if they're so uh, closely linked with someone who is explicitly racist. Yes. Well, that was part of it. I mean, they, they had, you know, they have found ways to have this discussion um, that don't, reach the level of, you know, blatant offensive racism that Derbyshire did, and that that did affect their ability to do that. The fact that they would, and he has called himself, he said, I think he called himself a casual racist in the past, and I guess that's okay, as long as you're casual about it. <laughs> as long as you're not as really, you're uh, yeah, as long as you're not really they, focused and working on it every day. Right. Just dip just in, like it. a weekend warrior type of guy. Yeah, it's just kind of a hobby, you know, rather than something that he does, you know, professionally. Um, but in any case, it did cause a little bit of dissonance, you know, among right-wingers to see their own, um, you know, they're one of their flagship publications have to, uh, you know, publicly... Uh, distance themselves from someone who's a blatant racist, um, and you know, obviously, a lot of that has come out. And interestingly, over the over the weekend, I had a little bit of a strange experience. Um, you know, uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates from the Atlantic, who writes a lot of um, a lot about you know racial issues and history and what have you. He noted that it was nice to see so many people questioning the charging of Zimmerman, which there is a lot of it. You know, why was he charged with second-degree murder? That affidavit was very um, kind of a skeletal affidavit, um, the charging document, mm -hmm. which apparently is kind of unusual, at least some people think it is, um, that it wasn't more, it didn't have more detail in it. Um, so there's been a lot of discussion among civil libertarians, lawyers, whatever, about this charging you know, the, the, the charge against Zimmerman. And so ta had wrote, written a tweet in which he said, it's good to see everyone concerned about the charging of Zimmerman uh, if only they would <laughs> do that in all the other cases, right? The point being that usually people don't pay any attention to that, and it's fine whatever the, the cops charge somebody with is, you know, pretty much what they've done, and we don't need to think about it. Right. Um, 
the response to that, I retweeted it, the response to that was kind of astonishing from both sides. Uh, you know, I got a bunch of, of people, you know, anti-Zimmerman people saying, you know, what's wrong with you? How dare you? Of course he committed murder. And a bunch of people saying, you know, yeah, well, he did, it's way overcharged and he shouldn't have been charged at all. He did the country a favor and blah, 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 you know. So it, you can see the, the contours of this um, kind of playing out in some interesting ways because normally you would find people who are sympathetic to the Trayvon Martin situation, as I am, being uh, very skeptical of prosecutors, and you would find the opposite, of course. You know, now they, they, all these conservatives are now defense lawyers who are, you know, uh, railing against the state. Um, so it's kind of interesting to see, see that play out in this situation. I, it's not something I have, uh, you know, I've had a lot of experience with in the past, but, you know, we'll see what happens. It's um, Obviously, to me, you know, the salient point is that an unarmed teenager was killed with a gun by someone who was following him around. And, you know, I don't, for me, that's punishable by something. You know, I'm not an expert in the law of Florida, but I got to say the idea that the guy would get off completely and not have to pay a price. When, you know, I had a neighbor not long ago, you know, had to do time for a car accident for a negligent homicide. So, you know. It kind of that doesn't quite seem right to me. Well, I mean, at the very least, what didn't seem right to me is that that he was not arrested, and there wasn't some process to determine whether or not he was guilty of something. I mean, that's what that 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 was the part that sort of like, you know, I I am always been very leery about sort of, you know, getting involved in in uh, these criminal cases of you know that are questions of fact, and uh, you know, uh, I I may have been. The only person who 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 didn't watch any of the OJ trial, I just it's just not for me uh, mm-hmm. because you know those things don't have necessarily a broader implications unless there's something systemically wrong. You know the biggest thing that came out of the OJ thing is that you know if you got money, uh, you have yep. a different justice system than anybody else, uh, yep. regardless of what the what the what the ruling is. Uh, but uh, it, it's it's I, I, I'm at least. I'm at least heartened by the fact that the guy has been brought in, and it seems that uh, they have some. Uh, there, you know, I originally thought it would be manslaughter, but I guess they have the the way that they structure their penal code in Florida is sort of hinky in some ways. But uh, well, yeah, you think? I mean, you can stand. You can apparently, according to some people, you can stalk somebody. You know, you can carry a gun. You can stalk them. You can shoot them down and claim that you know you had no choice. So. Um, I think Florida laws are a little bit hinky, but those laws are, are being, um, you know, are coming on the books in, in states across the country. There's a whole bunch of states that have those laws, you know, and, and it's a very creepy thing. Another topic for another day, but, Indeed. you know, the NRA and ALEC and all that, I mean, that's a whole hideous story in itself. Well, uh, Digby, I appreciate your catching me up on uh, what I missed this week. <laughs> Maybe maybe I should just take every week off and we'll just talk to you on Mondays. Hey, then... you know I'm I'm happy to do it, but I got to say, you know, I think I think maybe you were in the right. It, it, Disneyland was kind of happening, or Disney World was kind of our world last week. Yes. So you know, one way or another, we were all in Disney World. And di- and and after it was over, were you sort of like uh, funneled into a place where you could buy? Um, <laughs> uh, Cross promoted merchandise that was Absolutely. a reflective of that uh, story. <laughs> That, that's what Disney is all about now. But uh, <laughs> we'll talk more about that in the uh, better half of the program. Uh, Digby from the great blog, Hullabaloo, thank you so much for joining us.